It is now January 25th, 2022. This is Dr. Ara Duke Majan, CEO and founder of the Duke Spine Institute. And we are getting ready to get started with our first live spine surgery broadcast for the day. Our patient has herniated discs in his neck. Those disc herniations are causing symptoms as neck pain, arm pain, and he has traveled here from Puerto Rico. Virginia. Sorry, Virginia. He's Puerto Rican from Virginia. And um, he's having the Duke laser disc repair. He did not want a fusion. He did not want artificial discs. He didn't want to live with it. So he found us, and we are performing endoscopic repair of the two herniated discs, C3-4 and C6-7. All right, so we're gonna get started. I'm gonna be talking to my team. If you have questions, type them up. We'll be happy to answer them. We are live streaming. We should be live streaming on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn. All right, let's get started. So it looks like his jaw is above C3. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to C3 first, I guess, let's see. Probably C3 first because if I pull the needle out doing C6-7 we can le easier more easily put it back in So we are on the right side All right, are you ready? Huh? No, you're fine where you are. We'll start with a lateral. We're gonna do a quick AP Right not yet We're gonna start with a lateral then we're gonna do a quick AP Quick means you don't sit there and line everything up perfectly. You just got to, I just got to see the spinous processes. Uh, doctor, we're going to need your help at some point. If you can give some inline traction, I would just grab the skull and just hold it so he doesn't flex. He's nice. He's perfectly extended right now. And as I push down on his neck, he's going to start the kyphos. So let's just see how much kyphosis we get. He's totally relaxed. All right. Let's just see where we are. Do not shoot yet. Shot. So we're pretty low. We need to get up higher. So I will need you to hold his neck in slight extension as I manipulate him. I hate C3-4. C3-4 and C6-7 are the worst. But unfortunately, oh, take your time. Take your time. Yeah, go ahead and deal with that first. So what I like is when you grab the head, you kind of like push, uh, extend a little bit and push his skull towards his feet so that he does this rather than pulling. It's kind of counterintuitive, but yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna have to be a bit higher. And we have the esophageal temp probe in. Let's see where that is, shot. That's better. That's much closer, two, three, four. We're almost there. And let me see where my needle is. That looks good. And shot, give me an AP, shot. First lateral, then AP, quick. We're right there. Quick, 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 right now, quick shot. I just want to see how close I am. Perfect. Lateral. We're close. What is falling apart? What's back there falling apart? Crystal, can you check? And shot. Just about done, guys. Shot. That looks darn good to me. Shot. Let's get it. Hold on. Let's get an AP. Quick, quick. Almost done. Give me a second. Trust me, if your fingers are hurting, mine are hurting even more. Quick shot. That looks really good. Let's go a little bit more. Oh, away f no, towards me. I'm a little bit towards you. Shot. And that is a collapsed disc space. There we go. Shot. Perfect. All right, you can let go. You can let go. You can let go. You can go back to doing whatever you do. Are things just falling over down there? Yeah, just the S20 so All right, so we're good. All right, so C3-4 is rarely ever affected with degenerative disc disease. 
ever in, in the total population of human beings. But it is affected potentially in people with certain anatomy of the neck where their jawbone is higher. Like you, this guy, you can see his angle of his jaw is at C2. Um, there's a lot of people with their angle of the jaw down at C3. So, you know, that thick area of protecting the neck, the spine, is really going to protect C3, 4 in most people. But rarely we get somebody who has a symptomatic C3, 4 herniation, and this is one of those people. Thank God, you know, they, they have the right anatomy for us to do the surgery. Otherwise, it's very difficult. So I barely got up to C3, 4. I've probably done five patients with C3, 4 in 15 years out of 1,400 laser surgeries. So you can imagine how rare it is. There's only five. It's not common. Shot? Now that doesn't mean there aren't people with C3-4 disease. So we're going to do a discogram and shot. You're going to see a tear in the back of the disc. All right. So there's a, a tear in the front, a tear in the back. We are not fixing the front tear. It doesn't cause symptoms. The back tear is the one we're interested in. You can see a little bit of the dye in the retropharyngeal space. All right. So All right, let's do it. So Luis is suggesting we, we just start with one and then we go to the other. Just make sure you remind me to do the other one. <laughs> I think it's not a bad idea. So C3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7. You can see down at C6, 7, that's the next disc we're going to fix. There's like a little bird's beak of osteophytes in the front. Again, we're not interested in those. That's not why we're here. We're interested in the tear in the back of the disc. That's the source of the pain as well as the herniation. So you don't want me to put the needle. You want me to just do this one? Yeah. Yeah, I think C6-7 is going to be a little easier to do anyway than C3-4. So we got this. We're doing pretty good. All right. So um, we're discussing two different strategies to approach because we have two discs we have to fix. One is high at C3-4. One is low at C6-7. They're both at the extremes of the spine. They're both hard to get to normally, but our patient's got a nice thin neck, good anatomy. He's very well relaxed. The only thing is I will need relaxation when I'm done with this disc. You see how I push through the soft tissues, the strap muscles, everything gets displaced. So if he's gagging and t tightening up, I can't feel the spine properly. That's why they need chemical relaxation. My point is that normally I place two needles in the beginning while they're soft and supple. But now we're going to do one, and then I'm going to go to the other one in about 20 minutes, which means I need relaxation about 15, 20 minutes. So just letting you know. All righty. Take a shot. So we're placing the guide wire at this point. Let's see it. That looks good. And the guide wire is going to guide our dilator. So I'm going to remove the spinal needle which I use to access the C3-4 disc shot. I want to make sure the guide wire hasn't migrated. And next, we're going to make an incision. The incision for endoscopic Duke laser disc repair is 3 millimeters. Sorry, 4 millimeters. I apologize. The incision is 4 millimeters. The tube that I work through is 3 millimeters. Now, the outer diameter is 4 millimeters, but the working channel is 3 millimeters. So we're doing the entire surgery through a three millimeter tube. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Okay, needles back. I just injected one cc of local. It's epi with mar oh, marcane or lidocaine? Mar lidocaine? Yeah, we don't have the marcane, right? Back order. That's what McKesson says? Yeah. All right, shot. How long have you been practicing anesthesia for? Um, almost 20 years. All right. So uh, you probably graduated around the same time I did. Have you ever seen so many uh, drug shortages? No. No, I don't know. And can we really explain them? I mean, do you really believe? I don't believe it. I think they're just jacking the prices up with these stupid shortages. That gives them the ability to do that without legally calling it price gouging. 
Have you seen that elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's not silly. It's ridiculous, disgusting, and it really upsets me because it affects patient care. Shot. It's just greed. All right. So we are coming down with a dilator to the spine. I'm making sure the guide wire doesn't move into the spinal canal. Shot and pith the spinal cord. Um, so I'm coming up to the front of the disc. This is C34. Everyone agree? All right, you can see C2 up there, the disc base, C3, 4. That's one of the discs we're fixing. So we are now at the front of the spine. Let's get an AP. I want to verify my position. And as I've said before in these Duke laser disc repair surgeries, you want to be on the, long, uh, the anterior longitudinal ligament. Perfect. So what is the anterior longitudinal ligament? It is a band of tissue in the front of the spine where there's basically no blood supply and it's in between the, the muscles called the longus coli muscles where your sympathetic trunk runs so we want to stay out of those lo longus coli muscles for a couple of reasons one they bleed when you get into them so if you stay in the middle sonometer of the spine you won't get into the longus coli muscles shot all right now, <clears throat> the moment of great consternation for the uninitiated shot, which is where we use the mallet. Shot, and I can't tell you how many neurosurgeons cringe at this moment. Shot, yes, I cringed too years ago when I first started doing this, but um, now we've done about six, uh, 600, 700 cervical cases. That looks pretty good. Shot. And we've never had an injury, uh, not even a complication. So you just have to be really careful and constantly think about what you're doing and make sure you're not doing anything wrong. Now obviously, don't watch my videos and then try this at home but you need training and the training is at least about a year worth of training as long as we have adequate case volume. All right, now look at this little metal tube I'm holding. You all see this? This, can you see this? Hello McFly? Chat. Yes, Doc. Are you showing the camera on this? Yes, I am. not a baton all right so it's a little hard to see why don't you center it maybe zoom in a little bit so not you I'm talking to Chet no keep it on the camera view so that that TV can stay on camera view this TV can go to can go to my endo view all right all right so there it is the whole surgery will be done through this tiny metal tube it looks like a coffee straw I assure you it's much more expensive. And it's stainless steel, it's FDA approved, made in Germany. Um, and that's where we're gonna do the whole surgery through. So I have to bring this down into the disc. So I'm gonna go over the dilator. We call this sequential dilating. It's not something we discovered here at Duke Spine. It's pretty well known, sequential dilation. And I'm gonna leave shot I'm gonna leave the tubular retractor in so that's what this is it's called a tubular retractor it's shaped like a tube and it retracts the tissues and everything that we don't want getting in the way shot all right so we're approaching the front of the spine at this point and now I have to advance this tube through the front of the disc to the back because the problem for all of these patients with neck pain, headaches, arm symptoms, it's always in the back of the disc. And that's not something we've, we didn't discover the problems in the back of the disc. We discovered neck pain comes from the back of the disc. But arm symptoms have been known to come from the back of the disc. And what I was taught as a neurosurgeon was you do surgery to fix arm symptoms or spinal cord symptoms. 
but nobody ever understood how to get rid of neck pain. And we discovered that there's a tear in the back of the disc called the herniation or annular tear. And then the jelly goes through that annular tear, the jelly being the nucleus propulsus. And that's, that's the herniation you all hear about. But nobody ever talks about the annular tear except us because I discovered that the annular tear is the source of neck pain and back pain in you know, most people. And by cleaning the annular tear, we call it a debridement. Duke Spine Institute is the first in the world to do an annular debridement specifically to treat back and neck pain. And that's what we've been doing for years. And we're broadcasting so that people can see how it's done, what we do, and why we do it, and ask questions. Plus, it's kind of fun to be in the operating room. When you're a surgeon training, being in the operating room is something reserved for, it's kind of like a, a reward for being really good at what you do, Shot. Otherwise, they put you on the floor and you got to uh, just go manage labs and order tests. Right? You know it's true. So, you all get to join us in the operating room and feel like you're participating. You get to see what the surgeon sees and, and you get to ask questions. So it's almost like we're doing residency here. All right. All right, do we have any questions yet from our audience, Chet? No. Take a look here. You can see what I'm talking about. We're right up against the bottom of the chin. Here's the chin here. Can you see that, Chet? You gotta move the camera a little bit. All right, good. Well, this is the chin. The face is up here. This patient is intubated. They're under general endotracheal anesthesia. We do all of our cervical cases that way. And so the patient's completely asleep and immobilized. Now, I learned this approach and technique from the Koreans. And when I learned it from the Koreans 16 years ago, the South Koreans, they were the first to do cervical and they were having the patient awake and the patient was squirming around the operating table under propofol sedation. And the reason they had the patient awake, at least the way they told me was because, and the rest of the people watching, was because um, they wanted to know when, when the nerve was unpinched. Okay, so the patient would say, they would wake him up enough that the patient would say, oh yeah, my arm pain's gone, in Korean, of course. But to me, you know, as long as you do the, the work you need to do in the foramen and the back of the disc, and you get that decompression done, you don't need the patient awake. I mean, we do all of our surgeries with the patients asleep, all the anterior cervical discectomy infusion, and corpectomies, and everything, laminectomies, everything is done with the patient uh, asleep. Look at this, it's just the way it's set up, it's just so irritating. You guys gotta check this, okay? Otherwise it creates problems. So look at this, you gotta have this closed. All right, patient has to be um, asleep in my opinion, and that's how I do my surgeries. I've done it that way from the beginning. So that's one of my departures from the way the Koreans do it is my patients are asleep. And they're very grateful about that, I'm sure. Plus, you know, the Koreans had some spinal cord injuries in their series of patients they treated. As a matter of fact, they kind of stopped doing these cases because of that. And then they started up again. So, spinal cord injury is not something I want, expect, and I've not ever had it. And uh, having the patient immobilized and deep under anesthesia is part of that, making that happen. So I have never had my patients awake during this surgery for the cervical spine, and yet I've had the best results in the world for doing these surgeries. There's nobody that comes close. So what does that tell you? It tells you the patients don't need to be awake. So I think we got too much brightness. Let's turn the brightness down, please. People say, why don't you change your technique, Dr. Duke Majin? 
And my answer is simple. It works. Why change it? That's herniation right there. Huh? That's good. Thanks. So you can see it's a piece of nuclear material, stain blue, because our stain that we use stains nucleus material that's degenerated blue. So I know the blue stuff is nucleus propulsus, and the white stuff is annulus fibrosus because it doesn't stain, and scar tissue. So the things that are white are scar, all right? So remember, the herniation is an inflammatory process. It causes inflammation. That's where all the patient's pain comes from, inflammation. Okay, now that's contrary to what most spine surgeons understand. They have no clue that herniated discs cause inflammation. They just think they cause compression, pressure on nerves. Unfortunately, you have literally a million spine surgeons over history and none of them have ever figured out that herniated discs cause pain by inflammation. And we figured it out here years ago, 15 years ago. Now, I wasn't the first person to recognize that herniated discs cause inflammation. There were very intelligent scientists before me that were not spine surgeons, but were neuroanatomists and neurophysiologists uh, and PhDs. And they started to recognize inflammatory changes post-mortem. Oh man, what happened? You know what post-mortem means? When the patients are dead, right. All right, so what is that? What the hell is that? Why do we lose our image? Something on the oh, lens. It's not something on the lens. That may be the glue. Well, huh? Oh, the laser, you put it, on the it looks kind of blurry, right? So this is, I hope, not the fiber optics. I'm hoping it's the camera. The camera scope interface, but it may not be. And if it is, a pro that may be a problem. We're gonna need another cervical scope. Why don't you bring, one, bring another cervical scope in the room? Thank you. In case we need it. All right, uh, I need the uh, scope camera on huh I don't see oh no she just turned it on or something or went on that was weird huh I can't even see the fiber all right let's go look yeah who's doing these scopes huh who's repairing them huh yeah. I-E-S. There is something's wrong with the way they repair them. This is not right. But I don't know if they repair this one. I need to check the, you know, the serial. You have another scope? Yeah. Open it. Yeah. Light on. And, uh, I apologize. So one of the reasons we broadcast is so you guys can see what really happens in the operating room and how we troubleshoot things. So right now we believe there's a problem with the scope. Do not s take this off the field. Okay? Leave it on the field just in case. It's not the scope. So we're going to change scopes. These scopes run around thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars, close to fifteen grand per scope. Should looks like it should be a lot less than that, but that's the going rate. Anyway, I know you guys can't see it, but there's a working channel, and there's a light source that transmits light, and then there's a little fiber optic bundle that um, the fiber optic bundle transmits the image to the camera. I remember the first time I ever saw this thing, I was absolutely amazed because as a neurosurgeon, we don't do endoscopic surgery um, very much. Camera looks good. I mean, look at those little white spots, though. Go ahead. Look. Yeah. I don't think there are stars in the camera. So those are, that's, that's the camera, right? I mean, but that's fine. It doesn't affect our uh, performance. 
So we're going to reattach the light source. Yeah, I guess so. Right there. And then wait, wait, wait. I need to reattach the irrigation. Right there. Yep. All right. Close that port. And let's just test it first. Uh, this looks better. This looks better. Yeah, it's a damn fiber optic bundle. This is better. So we're back to our good image. So it was the scope. And unfortunately, these scopes fail because the glue inside them that holds the lens or fiber optic bundle in place, that glue uh, goes bad. And every time it goes bad, we got to send the scope in and spend $1,000 to get it repaired. And honestly, I think those damn repair shops are using the wrong glue so they can get more business. Okay? Why? Because I never had this many problems before. And you know, we may have to go back to using Wolf. It's just Wolf is so damn expensive. The Wolf charges three times as much. But their scopes last longer. So again, it's just one of the problems of running a business with a bunch of hyenas waiting to steal your, your kill. Right? So, yeah, definitely. I think uh, we need to have a talk with them, Luis, because whatever they're using, that glue is just not holding after you autoclave. Exactly. I told you, you've got to call them and talk to their technician, and you've got to say, what glue are you using? You give me the name. And if they say Elmer's glue, okay, <laughs> I need, to, I need you to report them. Uh, so the glue that has to be used is, has to be autoclavable glue, meaning it has to stand up to the temperature and pressure of an autoclave. That's how we clean our surgical instruments. All of these instruments we use are cleaned with an autoclave. God damn. How many more scopes do we have? Yeah. They're all ready to go? Yeah, ready. Right. Some way. Okay. Mm hmm Any questions? That was a bone spur I just shaved down. Any questions from our audience? One second, Doc. Kevin just walked in. It's really aggravating. Luis, you, you, I need to know by Thursday. Yes, sir. I want to know the name of the glue used by this company. Yes, sir. And I want to know the name of the glue used by Wolf. Not a problem. All right? Both. It's just not our day. We're going to have to score this. Light on. Light on. Oh. I think. I Sco uh, laser off. We have to. S uh, I want a little bit more of a tip. All right, I need the tweezers. The yellow tweezers. Is it sterile? It is sterile. Yes, sir. All right. So we'll take a break for a minute. How's our patient? All I know is this is this is a glue problem. It is not a a technical problem. We need to find out what glue Wolf uses and what glue this company uses and what glue the other. I got to have answers, Luis. You got to get them. Cuz it's affecting our surgeries now. So the issue we're having is the fibers that are glued together inside this scope have uh, shifted. And the reason they shift is they, the, the glue that's holding them in place has probably failed, which it, always, it does. It's very well known, but um, it just seems to be potentially failing 
more frequently than I wanted to, which of course I never wanted to fail, but in reality, it, these scopes have to be re-glued. They, they call it maintenance. Uh, we maintain them, obviously, but whenever the lens and the image shifts to a blurry image, that means that the glue has failed and the scope needs to be re-configured, re, uh, rebuilt, etc. So that's what happened to our original scope. We just changed it. We got a good image now. Um, I wonder how long Wolf will support these scopes. It's a big question for me. Wolf is the manufacturing company out of Germany, Richard Wolf. They make a great product, but they're a small company. Of course, every, everything is FDA approved. What, the scope? Yeah. All righty. Let's see what we got down here. Let's bring this fiber. Uh, it is better. I think part of my problem is I'm zoomed. I need to zoom in a little bit. No, that's the brightness. There's the zoom. So I'm gonna adjust the focus just a little bit, see if I can make it better. Now what we're looking at down here, this crack or abyss, is actually the uh, epidural space. So we're looking, the spinal cord is just down there. Uh, we wanna stay away from that, obviously, but I need to get rid of the herniation at the back of this disc um, on both sides. And the nice thing about cervical, is this, can we move this IV pole just a little bit, please? It's like right in my view, field of view. And um, you can see the laser fiber. Yeah. It's a little bit fuzzy and grainy. And that's the problem with these fiber optic scopes. They always are a little fuzzy and grainy. All right, so I wanna go your way, right, Luis? And that's what we're gonna do. This is all herniation right here. It's kind of just pouring down into space, into the space, the epidural space. So I'm, it's a bit calcified too. My way. Let's swing it around. All right. So this is the annular tear we talk about. It's at the back of the disc. It is um, the annulus fibrosus and it's made mostly out of collagen and just past it is the epidural space, well, the posterior ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament, and the epidural space. So the posterior ligament is the last barrier before the spinal cord. So this is all scar tissue here. It's calcified with what's called dystrophic calcification. And what happens is your body doesn't like injured tissues, so your, your uh, inflammatory system attacks injured tissue and tries to fix it by just first removing it and then remodeling and you know it's kind of like remodeling a house when they when your body's inflammatory system encounters tissues that are abnormal and it recognizes them as abnormal it destroys first just like you would wreck the interior of a house in order to remodel it. And then it re rebuilds it. But it usually rebuilds it with, you know, 
scar tissue. And the longer that inflammatory process goes on, the more scar tissue that is formed. Now we have a limited ability to rebuild other types of tissue like blood vessels, because you have these, um, these stem cells that live close to the damaged area. And those stem cells supply little cells that make blood vessels and little cells that make nerves. And you get new nerves, new blood vessels. And a lot of times just a bunch of scar tissue. And that's kind of what we see at the back of these discs. So the disc is trying to heal, but it's healing with scar tissue. So. your body has a very limited ability to repair damaged tissues with the same type of cells that were originally there from birth. All right, nice. Any questions? Got to make sure Chet's awake. Chet? Yes, Doc. One second. Any I got questions? Kevin here. Sure. Hey, Dr. Duke. Uh, Charles from Facebook asks. Who is this? Kevin. Kevin, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Charles from Facebook asks. A little bit more volume, Kevin. I'm sorry. Charles from Facebook asks, can any problems in the cervical spine cause the heart arrhythmias? Can any problem with the cervical spine cause Ca arrhythmias of the heart? Yes, sir. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, let me think about that. Let me ask my anesthesiologist too because she may be smarter than me when it comes to that stuff. Uh, do you, can you think of a, like a compression of the spinal cord in the neck or nerve root that would cause? I mean, I know the vagus nerve. Uh, I know the sympathetic trunk runs in front of the spine, but I mean, I've not heard of any, have you? What is it? Uh, spinal cord injury? Yes. So spinal cord injuries can cause cardiac arrhythmias, my anesthesiologist is telling me. And so, yeah, that would be something that you want to be concerned about. But spinal cord injuries are usually, you're going to know, and you're not going to be walking around with a spinal cord injury. Those are typically, has to be severe enough that you would be hospitalized and having decompression surgery. Yeah, trauma. Sure. Yeah, you're not getting out of the hospital like that. All right, so we are in the foramen on the patient's left at C34. There were bone spurs here. You can see the fibers of the posterior ligament down there. There's a little bit of red around them. Just some blood vessels like veins. We are out in the foramen and I'm trying to get that herniation out of there. There's a little bit left. I've gotten most of it. You can see the dura down there. And I don't see anything left in the foramen. I think we've gotten it all. Pretty good view there, huh? So, all right. I'm going to take one more look and we're done with this level. Just make sure I don't leave anyone behind. A little bit of scar tissue here, but I don't want to gild the lily. We've talked about that. That can be dangerous. Can end up because those are fibers. Those fibers right there are the PLL. And this scar right here is from the herniation and the annulus, but there's nothing there left. There's no herniation there. So I've gotten the herniation out, and we're not on a scar tissue mission. We're on a herniation mission, an annular debridement mission. And I think I've 
debrided the annulus because that's only PLL left. There's a little bit more here, but it's mostly scar tissue. See the golden color is dystrophic calcification. That golden color, that's what calcium looks like when it interacts with the laser energy. So this is just scar tissue that's been calcified. Bone spurs, I blasted the ones I needed to, we're done. So this level's done. I still need this patient relaxed for uh, another 10 minutes. And then we can start getting them reversed. All right, so we're gonna light on. We're gonna put a little betadine. We used to use uh, um, bacitracin, but that's fallen out of favor. My entire surgery career was bacitracin. I need to suck this out. So you need to give this, this to me in the right sequence. Okay. It looks good, take it. So we're gonna just suck the irrigation out. And I'm actually, normally at this point when I go to disc two, it's adjacent to disc one that I'm fixing, the first one but not in this case. The disc that I'm fixing now is literally uh, miles away, figuratively. And so, yeah, I'm gonna take it out. So I'm gonna take this out completely. And normally I walk it. I walk this down to the next disc, but since the next disc is so far away, I can't do that. It wouldn't be safe, and I can't do this through one incision. I have to do two, and I told the patient that that I would have to use two incisions, they understand. But I'm gonna show you this incision in a minute, it's amazing. So you see we've lost about a drop of blood, maybe two, you could argue, right? But far less than a CC. Come on in. We never do AP, it's always lateral. So folks, we're gonna go to C67, everyone agree? C67? So we may need a shoulder pull and I'll need some inline traction from the anesthesiologist. Doctor, if you don't mind, I don't need it this second. I'll tell you when I need it. It'll be in about three minutes, four minutes. In the meantime, I'm just holding pressure because I'm not, the, the blood. What? Irrigation's on. What do you need? All right. So one of the advantages of the Duke laser disc repair, endoscopic surgery, there's no bleeding. We literally had two drops of blood. Um, there's no scar tissue. There's just one little four millimeter incision, that's it. Everything else is tissue that's been dilated or spread apart rather than cut. Every other surgeon that does ACDF, artificial disc, laminectomy, foramenotomy, blah, 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 open surgery, there's cutting of tissue, there's bleeding, and there's scar tissue, and there's pain. These patients literally will come in tomorrow taking no pain medication and they have, will have zero pain. All right, so let's look here. There's the incision, four millimeter. You won't be able to see it because of this chin, but it's tiny. And we're gonna do another one here so you can see that one. All right, two dro three drops of blood. We just increased our blood loss by 50%. <laughs> All right, I like to hold pressure for a few minutes. For It's just venous ooze. I don't think this guy has any clotting stuff, right? He's not on blood thinners, he's not anti-inflammatory, there's no ginkgo biloba, fish oil, turmeric. So, what's the problem? No problem. Yeah, I, I don't know how much shoulder pull we need. I don't think we need that much because you can see six, seven right there. This, this patient has a wonderful neck, by the way. And we sh I hope we gave him a discount because he has such a nice neck. It makes all of our jobs easier, right? So anyway, that should be good on the pressure. Again, we're not cutting any blood vessels, arteries or anything. It's just a little oozing from under the skin. I think this patient, because he's had now three and a half drops of blood, I think he had, must have had something he was taking herbally that's causing him to ooze a little bit, inhibiting platelet function. But long story short, it's nothing, huh? I know, there's something though. Maybe he drinks Red Bull, I don't know. All I know is that that's not normal to ooze that much after the incision, so. It's fine, okay. Um, 
Next, we're going to go down to C67. So let's get a shot and see what we got. That looks good. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, the bird beak. Everyone agree? All right. So hopefully we don't need any pulling at all. Let me see what I can do with my fingers, my magical little fingers. Are we ready? Just make sure he's not gagging. He's not coughing. He's supple. I think you've done a very good job, doctor. Let's get started. Uh, make sure I don't have too many wrinkles. Otherwise, they can catch on the needle and you have a bad day. I can feel the collarbone here. There we go. How many, you have one needle on the field or more? I have more needles. I have a That's all right. We're good. Fire away. All right, so we're there. I just need to see if we're in the midline. Let's get a shot and then get another one. Quick, 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 quick. My f AP, another AP, sorry. As soon as I'm done with the lateral, I wanna see the AP. Quick shot. All right, good, lateral. So I could pretty much in the middle there. And now we'll go ahead and advance once I get an a, a lateral view back. And you bang the table enough times. <laughs> I got to give Monica a hard time. Shot. Right? If I didn't give you a hard time, who would? Monica? Nobody is that wants to give you a hard time. Shot. Nobody They're all afraid of you. They're all afraid of you. Hey, Pete. So, oh my God, that's overexposed. You cannot take my photos from my family. Right? Let's just see the AP. Let's do an AP, a nice AP. So we use a combination of anterior posterior, which is front back in plain terms. And that's horrible. Let's go try to find uh, the center. We're way off. Can you straighten his, his neck out, please? Can we straighten that head? I would just pull him towards you and derotate him. Just make sure he's looking straight up at the ceiling. If you can just straighten him out, that would be great. And then we can get a better AP. All right. Now you, you're off on your um, trajectory with the fluoro. I need you to line up the spinous processes. That's getting better. I think you need to keep going though. Shot. He's probably got scoliosis, so there we go. So it's very, very, very important if you want to do this kind of surgery as a surgeon, you must pay attention to the anatomy of the spine. And you can see the spinous process right there. It's literally touching the needle. So the spinous process has to be first between the pedicles right in the middle, which it is at the level you're treating because patients have scoliosis, so it's easy to get lost. So you wanna make sure the spinous process is between the pedicles at the level you're treating, which ours is. Uh, Monica got it lined up perfectly, and you can see the fluoros coming from the side. That means he has scoliosis. We're not here to treat his scoliosis. We're here to treat his, um, and show them the tip. Oh, sorry, go ahead. All right. Let me just see here. I wanna make absolutely sure we're good. I know we're in deep enough. And let's just do a discogram while I got you here. Let's do the AP part and then you can go back to a lateral and just stay there. So we do a discogram in this case for the purpose of identifying tears in the disc. And you can actually see the tear back there, um, lateral. And you want to also, while I'm in the endoscopic view, I want to be able to see the herniation, the herniated disc material, which is the nucleus propulsus, the center of the disc, that's what's herniating through the tear. So that nuclear material that's normal is white. It doesn't stain blue. But nuclear material that is scarred will stay white too, but also with a blue tint. And then the nucleus propulsus that's degenerated, it's acidic. So it binds this dye beautifully. So the dye, the blue dye, the Duke spine dye only binds to um, degenerated nucleus propulsus, basically. 
and that's why it's so valuable for this treatment. Can we tune down the exposure a little bit? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. We are at C67, everyone agree? All right, and you can see the dye that I injected, it actually leaked out to the side of the spine through a tear on the side. And that's really good because today we got to see a front tear, a back tear, and a side tear. The key is you don't need to repair side tears, front tears, because they don't cause any symptoms. There's no nerves there, there's no spinal cord there to be pinched, there's no nerve root, and there's no pain coming from side or front tears. It only comes from the back tear. Again, discovered at Duke Spine Institute. That's why we do the Duke Laser Disc Repair, to repair the posterior tears, not the side tears, not the front tears. They don't matter. Believe it or not, they don't. Shot? All right, let's see if we can get a, a little bit better. Uh, I would say a little zoom in, a little orbit, a little bit of orbit because he's scoliotic. Um, I would say you need to drop your side if I had to guess. And then let's get a little shoulder pull just a little bit and a little inline traction just a little bit. And we should get a nice picture as long as we're not overexposed. Overexposed x-rays mean everything is so white. And um, not that we have a problem with white. It's, uh, it's just too much white is not good for x-rays. Okay, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Everyone agree? Why does it look a bit blurry? Can you, sh can you take one more picture? That's better. That's better. All right. So I'm gonna advance the guide wire and I wanna get another picture. Uh-huh. And I'm gonna advance it a little more. That should be good. Shot. All right. So I'm in as far as I can go safely with the guide wire. I've got pretty much almost a true lateral Remember, you can be fooled by the scoliosis, so it's very important you get a true lateral, or you will not know. Let's get an AP. You will not know uh, how deep you are, okay? Because if you don't have a true lateral and you're looking obliquely at the vertebral body and disc, you could actually be further back than you think you are. All right. Oh, your image is reversed. That's why you're confusing the hell out of me. Come on. I <laughs> think you've been hitting the bottle a little too much. <laughs> okay, look at that tear. Okay, that's dye around the nerve root, I believe. That's pretty cool. You can see, show them the nerve root dye, the dye around the nerve root. That is actually the C7 nerve root. Show them. Monica is going to go over. Just have the floral picture up, guys. Okay. Hello, Chet. Earth to Chet. No, that's... That's extravasated in the soft tissue. Show the root coming out of the foramen. Up a little more, down a little bit. No, to the left, 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 there. Now trace it out, it's like a long root. It's like a long trunk, and other way. Yeah, right there, go, 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 all the way down and out. Yes, keep going through that dark area, the trapezoid, and there it is right there. So it runs behind the trapezoid. That is the nerve root. That is. Uh, this is omnipaque dye. It's got iodine in it, and basically it's going around the nerve, not in the nerve, but around it uh, in the epidural space. So that's pretty cool. So the tear actually is in the back on the left side, and it, the, the key here, and this is what taught me so much, is if a liquid can go around the nerve root like that, from the disc, around the nerve root like that, through the tear, well then inflammatory juices can too. So if there's inflammation in the back of the disc, those juices get around the nerve root and they travel just like the dye does. And they irritate the nerve root. We call that radiculitis. Many of you have probably heard of radiculitis if you get an EMG nerve conduction study and it doesn't show radiculopathy. It shows radiculitis, that's inflammation of the nerve root. Well, where do you think that inflammation comes from? It comes from the inflammation in the back of the disc. Are we doing twitches? Or, or is that your hand? Oh, okay. You can take your hand off. I'm so sorry. I apologize. We didn't need you for the last five minutes holding the head, but that's nice that you did that. I'm sure the patient appreciates it. I apologize. I should have said something. I'm really not a prankster like that. Right, Monica? No. 
All right, so let's get to some serious discussion. Where are you from, doctor? Where do you live? Uh, Tampa. Oh, Tampa. Tampa. Nice. My brother is a neurosurgeon in Tampa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's with uh, some hospital system over there. I can't remember. He has a private practice. Dr. Uh, Amir, Amir Amadian and Armin Duke Majan, my brother. They have a neurosurgery practice. They take call at the hospitals and all that stuff that I, I hate to do. I'm a little too old for that. I'm too frail. I enjoy my practice, you know, elective, fixing people's pain. I don't like running into the hospital in the middle of the night, sucking out blood clots and clipping aneurysms, putting in shunts. So I focus now just on this stuff. Okie dokie, there's the uh, dilator tip at the back of the disc, perfect. You can see that we have the back of the vertebral body of six is slightly rotated. So I need Monica to fix that just a little bit with her orbit. I would drop your side just a degree. It's no more than a degree. Let's see where that is. That's it, we fixed it. Now the shoulder's gotten in the way. So I will need Luis eventually to pull the shoulder a little bit. <laughs> All right, sure. All right, let's try it. Let's see. Pull a little bit. Well, just let's just see what we do on the shoulder. Gentle shoulder. Let's see what we got. Yeah, I, I brought it down, um, you know, a little bit. So not yet. I'm not ready yet. I'm going to go first advance this to the spine, which I can see just fine. So the, the dilator is going in. Again, this is uh, the stuff that freaks out neurosurgeons and everyone else in the world, all my critics, shot. When I stop and look, that means it's time to take a shot. It's nonverbal communication, shot. So I'm advancing the dilator down to the front of the spine, okay? And you see that first tube I went past, that is the endotracheal tube. Uh-huh, and then the second, tube is the uh, temperature probe in the esophagus. So you can kind of see anatomically where is the trachea and where is the esophagus. And we've navigated just past them, okay? So now I'm in the front of the spine. Let's get an AP. I want to make sure I'm on the ALL, ALL, anterior longitudinal ligament. So it's safe because if you go off the ALL into the longus coli muscles, you could be asking for a lot of trouble. You can get bleeding. Yep, we're perfect in the center. You can see the guide wire goes beyond the center to the foramen that we're headed towards. So at this point, uh, everything is going perfect. Couldn't be better. We've lost three and a half drops of blood. And yeah, that's it. All right, so now I'm going to advance and we are at the correct level. Everyone agrees. C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. So. We have verified about 10 times, which is always what I recommend every spine surgeon do. I, I'm a very experienced spine surgeon and I verify 10 times. Uh, why? Uh, because you never want to operate on the wrong level, okay? And I never have in 25 years of being a doctor, never. And it's because I take my time, I verify multiple times and I get help from my staff. You know, and if somebody says, oh no, you're at the wrong level, you know, either way, you're announcing the level you're doing so the nurse can check the board and make sure that you're announcing the right level. And then of course, you've got people who know how to read imaging and they could tell you if you're uh, doing the right level, so. And if somebody's opinion differs with mine, we just stop, we reassess before we go any further. So it's just good medicine. Trust but verify, verify, verify. Sean? All right, I can feel we're at the back of the disc at this point. So um, we're gonna bring in the, the tube and now we're at, we're at full, a full four drops of blood for blood loss. Um, this is the tube that we're gonna use. If you missed it earlier, the whole surgery is done through this tube. The outer diameter, four millimeter, the inner diameter, three millimeter. So you got about a half a mil of metal on each side. It's a very thin tube, but it doesn't expect to have much pressure. So it just needs to retract the tissues. It's about 20 millimeters of mercury. 
And of course, tubular designs transmit forces nicely. I use a twisting method to free it up from soft tissues. I could probably just jam it in there, but <clears throat> you know, I don't want to grab a vein and rip it. So by twisting, you, you kind of free the, the outer, outer wall of the tube away from soft tissues. Let me just get that in, okay. All right, so I'll do this. If you can give me a little shoulder pull and then that way I can see this go in. A little shoulder pull, just a little, that's perfect, right there, perfect. Everybody hold, shot. I wanna make sure the tip of the dilator doesn't go into the spinal canal as the tube advances through the disc. Remember, the tube's passing through jelly. Jelly doesn't care. So we're not hurting anything and it's avascular. It's basically like hydraulic fluid. You know, you just push it aside. I think that's it. Yeah, we're there. So we're good. We're good. All right. Yeah, we'll hold this while you do that. Thank you, everybody. We're in like Flynn. What can I say, Flynn? Your dad must have named you that way for a reason. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. So perfect. Six, seven, three, four, six, seven. We're, we're, this will be our second and last disc. We'll be done in 15 minutes. And it's a Band-Aid. No, there's no wound to close. And like I said, you've never seen this before. And you'll never see it again anywhere outside of here. Unfortunately. Because all the surgeons want to put metal in. That's where they make big bucks. Fusions and artificial discs. I've taught this at the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, the Congress of Neurosurgeons, the Society for the Advancement of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery, and yet, unfortunately, in the United States, there's such a powerful lobby by the implant companies that make money that they keep the surgeons from learning this technique and, uh, in, and using it, which is clearly better for patients because you don't have to have metal in your neck. You don't have to go to the hospital. It's outpatient fast recovery, but that's what I'm up against. Literally the power of money, preventing this technology from disseminating and being used everywhere. That's why I decided, screw the doctors. I'm not gonna bother trying to train them. I'm just gonna go straight to the patients because they're the ones who actually care. It's their neck and back. Actually, you're gonna see back today too. Backs are much easier. Well, not, not for you, but for me. Back is, you got to juggle the propofol, you know, in a prone position with an unsecure airway. So. Now this patient's interesting. He's originally uh, from Puerto Rico, but he's living in, I guess, Virginia now. And he came because he has, and this is something that I've found quite often. People with herniated discs that are painful, they typically have them not just in one party, body part, they have it in the other. Like the, if they have it in their neck, they also have it in their back quite often, or they develop it in their back. So he actually has back and neck, and we're gonna do his back on Thursday. So his neck today is back on Thursday. Yeah. He's here with his lovely wife. She's here to support him. And that's another thing, folks. People in pain, it doesn't just affect the patient in pain. It affects their whole family and their friends. Um, no one wants to see someone suffer in pain. Pain is so debilitating, especially chronic pain. It really robs people of the quality of life, which is why we do these surgeries, to restore people's quality of life. I was, uh, I'm having a little bit of hip pain myself. Unfortunately, arthritis runs in my family and I was a soccer player and my hip started hurting. I injured it in soccer when I was younger uh, and it took me a whole season to recover. I literally took a shot on goal with my left foot and had severe pain in my hip. It took me a year to recover. I didn't know what it was, I was only like, 16, 15, and now years later, it hurts me. So I took my dog for a walk last night with my wife, and I only got about 
two blocks and then I had to turn around and come back because it was acting up. And it just made me think about my patients who have back pain all the time, neck pain, and they can't really do things, you know, they're supposed to do. Like that's a walk that my wife and I enjoy doing every night. Um, it's kind of our time together. And so you can imagine how that affects relationships, right? Having chronic pain because you can't be active. And couples, they want to be active together. They want to do things together. Well, how can you do things together when one of them is suffering? And the other one doesn't want to go out and do things because they feel guilty. So chronic pain is really something that is truly under appreciated by the world and society and undervalued. And at Duke Spine, we're able to cure chronic back and neck pain. I try telling people this on Facebook and they think I'm nuts. And, uh, but the only problem is we really do cure chronic back and neck pain. We do it all the time. And we actually show people how we do it. So I, I agree with the comment that I'm nuts, but I'm not lying about it. That's for sure. <laughs> how many surgeons would show their entire surgery unedited, live? Not many. Not many. As a matter of fact, I think I'm the only one literally in the world except the Koreans every once in a while, but they don't do it all the time. We literally live stream 100% of our surgeries and we've been doing it for eight years. So on YouTube, there are thousands of my surgeries for everyone to see. So if I screw up, you get to be the first ones to see it. The key is you don't have to screw up as a surgeon. I know surgeons tell you that there are a chance of screwing up, but the reality is, is you can do surgery without screwing up. I know it's hard to believe. Who would ever think that humans could run a marathon without stopping? But they do. It just takes training, perseverance, dedication, thought, discipline, sacrifice, motivation, creativity, and with all those ingredients, humans can do amazing things. We see it all the time. So doing spine surgery and not having screw ups is possible, but it takes all those characteristics and unfortunately most surgeons don't have them. So you're not gonna get those kind of results, but in a few cases. So I encourage people, find a good surgeon if you're gonna have surgery. Make sure that they have a low complication rate. You know, make sure they can walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Right, Joe? You tell your dad I gave him a little shout out, all right? Flynn? All right. So what are those white things there? That's the posterior longitudinal ligament, all right? That's really um, past the annulus. There is no annulus past that. This is the last of the annulus, it's calcified. All right, there's the edges of the vertebral body. On the left is C6, on the right is C7. And you have a little bit of scar tissue from inflammation from the herniation. Okay, but for the most part, you're looking at the, the dura and here the, the posterior longitudinal ligament. So why is there PLL here and not here? Well, the PLL is not across the entire back of the disc. It's just uh, in the middle part. That's dura right there. That's dura, okay? I made a hole in the PLL just to look and see if there was any herniation behind it. There's none. Just don't wanna make a hole in the dura, okay? So I'm gonna keep going out the, the left foramen. I wanna see if there's any more herniation out here. So I'm gonna be adjusting the tube a little bit. And if you do this kind of surgery, it's very important you don't torque on the endoscopic tube, okay? That's where the fiber optic things are. And if you're torquing on that endoscopic tube, guess what? You're gonna break those fibers. You've got to torque on the actual tube, the stainless steel tube, the tubular retractor. That's where you apply force. If you do that properly, you won't destroy your scopes. 
and you won't have to be repairing them every week because repairs will drive you out of business. It's no joke. The repairs are very expensive. The scopes are very expensive and the repairs are very expensive, but more importantly, you don't have a scope while it's being repaired. So it puts you out of business for a while. Yeah, we've got all these little pieces of Baba Ganesh. All right, let me grab some of that out. Any questions? Yes, we got Alan from Facebook. He says he has a lumbar moderate, moderate bilateral neural foramenal narrowing in the L4 and L5. Yep. And mild nerve impigment from L4. Yes. Is this stenosis? Can laser fix this? Yes, laser can definitely fix it. That's what the laser fixes. 100%. Send us your MRI. Can you type a link in? It's uh, MRI.dukespine.com. MRI. We'll do Doc. Huh? We'll, I'll write it right now, Doc. MRI.dukespine.com. Yeah, just use the link and it'll take you to a form online. Anyone can submit their spine MRI and we will review it for free, no charge. And then we'll set up a Zoom call and I'll meet with you for 10 minutes, go over your MRI, and I'll tell you what, what I think needs to be done. Uh, first of all, I'll tell you what your problem is, what's causing your symptoms. And then I will tell you what I recommend to be done. And I'll answer your questions. We do that as a free service to the world, to the worldwide community. Has nothing to do with your insurance, has nothing to do with money or your ability to pay or treat. We do it for anybody, even people who don't come here. So uh, why do we do it? Because people need answers and you're not going to get them elsewhere. Okay. Most doctors have no clue what's going on in terms of what causes symptoms. And unless you have nerves that are being pinched badly, they don't want to treat you. They want to just send you to pain management. Pain management can't fix those, those sources of pain. Those are surgical fixes, but the surgeons just don't know that because they haven't been trained properly to do it and they haven't figured it out on their own. So the reality is, is chronic spine pain is not a pain management fix. It never will be unless pain management docs are doing spine surgery. It requires the Duke laser disc repair if it's a disc pain and it requires uh, facet treatments if it's facet pain. And of course, if there's a fractured bone, you need fr the fracture treated. But the most common cause of neck and back pain that's chronic, meaning longer than you know, two months, is the disc, the herniated disc, the annular tear. It's not stenosis. Spinal stenosis only causes leg symptoms or arm symptoms. So if you have leg symptoms like pain shooting down your leg, then you need spinal stenosis surgery. And that's, uh, again, the, the laser surgery that we do will work. Or you can have a more traditional surgery where the surgeon will remove all the bones and ligaments in the back of your spine and unpinch your nerves. Highly invasive, very painful, long recovery, lots of scar tissue, plenty of muscle damage. You don't want it. That's what I used to do a long time ago. Unfortunately, most spine surgeons haven't learned the newest technology and techniques. So they're stuck in the old ways. And like I said, many of them like doing fusion because they get more money, a lot more money for fusion. I get more money for fusion. Oh, look at that herniation. I love it. Come to Papa. It's like a little roach just sitting down there wanting to be loved. We're going to take it out. We're going to give it an APGAR score. Oh, it's too big. doesn't want to come out. Oh, I don't know. There it is. All right. So Men are always bragging about how big it is, but the reality is it's not that big. See, it's small, but that is a typical herniation. Can you see this on my finger? You've got to move the camera, boys. This is an interactive video, interactive session. Move the camera. Move the camera. There we go. Zoom in. 
That's why I paid for a PTZ camera. So you can do things like that. You see this right here? You gotta have some light. It's, it's overexposed. All right, see that? That's a typical herniation in the cervical spine, okay? I just wanna show it to you, it's not that big. They're small, they look big in the scope because this is magnifying everything. That's what the endoscope does. So it's probably two millimeters, maybe three, because the inner diameter of this tube is about three millimeters. Okay, there's another herniation right there coming out. So these herniations are literally just sitting there in the back of the disc, causing problems, misbehaving. And I go in there and, and uh, start using a laser and they just say, whoa, we don't want any part of this. Let's get the heck out of Dodge. So they leave and they leave quick. So this is the foramen on the right, little bits and pieces. Now I don't know what scar tissue, what's herniation, but you can see the scar tissue, little scar tissue tendrils there. That, that was where the herniation was sitting that I just took out. And um, you can see it was causing an inflammatory reaction. Okay, just about done. I wanna make sure we get everything. These are some bone spurs around the foramen. I don't mind getting them. They're not supposed to be here. They're close enough to the nerve root. I think that may be a herniation there as well. So I'm gonna play with it, see what happens. It's definitely not the nerve. Huh? Are you guys, we need five minutes, I think. I'm hoping five more minutes. So the, the nerve root, remember, is exiting right here. So we wanna be just super careful that we don't get it with the laser. It would be a bad day, a really bad day. I don't see anything in the framing. There's no more chunks. I'm gonna go to the other side. We're about three minutes from finishing. And just take a peek. There's a little herniation, not much. It's about half a millimeter there. Oh, by the way, the laser fiber itself, the glass tube at 12 o'clock, that is half a millimeter wide. So it kind of gives you a reference point for everything else down there that you see. Again, want to make sure we don't do any damage to anything we're not supposed to damage. And <clears throat> basically that's it, it's clean. So we're done. Lights on please, scrub off please. Fuse. Now, why aren't we fusing this patient? I'll tell you why. Scrub off please. Because we did not take the disc out. We left 95% of the disc in there. We only took out maybe 5%, which was the herniations. We didn't take any of the normal disc out. So we left the normal disc there. We don't need to put a cage there. We don't need to put an artificial disc there. The only reason why people put artificial discs and cages and plates is because they had to take the disc out to get down here. But we did it in a stealthy ninja-like fashion. Because of that, we left the disc the normal disc, and we don't need to do anything to stabilize the segment. So. All right, let's show everybody. Can you guys see this okay? I'm gonna take this vacuum little adapter off. Can you guys see the tube? Show them the neck, I wanna, yeah, that's good guys. Here, let's move this too. You guys see we did the whole surgery in that little tube there. So we got two, two holes, like a little vampire. We did a pediatrician last week. Pediatrician? She had the same thing, two little holes. I told her husband, the vampire got her. The Duke Spine vampire, the one in living in the operating room. We turned our heads and next thing you know, there's two holes in her neck. <laughs> It's amazing what, what I've seen do, this surgery do, you know. I had an electrician whose arm was paralyzed, literally couldn't even lift it. 
for like months. He had a herniated disc, C6-7. Maybe he had two. I went in and did the surgery. And normally I tell people don't expect, you know, to get better because you, you've waited so long. There's some atrophy. It's just kind of serious nerve damage. Anyway, a year later, his arm's normal. He actually works on our building. And every time he sees me, he goes, thank you so much. So we've lost five drops of blood, maybe six. Let's just say one cc. We'll round it up to 20 drops. Blood pressure looks good. All right. So looking good. And you think the advances in spine care happen in academics. They don't. Yeah, the best spine surgeons are in private practice. They always have been, they always will be. Do we have more questions, gentlemen? Don't be shy, ask away. Any more questions? All right, no complications, EBL 1cc. This was a Duke laser disc repair. This was a left approach. Sorry, right approach, you're correct, my bad. That's why I say it out loud, because I make mistakes. So it's a right approach. I don't make mistakes with surgery, just with talking. Right approach. C34 and C67. Everyone agree? All right. That's good. I signed the form. We're good to go. Our next patient is a lumbar? All right. I'm going to go sign the next patient. If you have questions, folks, type them up. I'll come there and answer them for you.